In these past several weeks, we've been talking on lessons from the sanctuary, on how to face the valley of the shadow of death, and realizing that we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places, and as Jesus said, we've been given the keys to the kingdom. It's been about encouragement, and we're going to continue today, but what we're going to do is go back a few years to the year 2014, when I preached a message when we were down in a storefront church in Davenport, Iowa, and we were talking about encouragement once again, at the time when this was this was prior to my having cataract surgery, and so I'm wearing glasses, I'm a few pounds heavier, and uh, but you know, the message is really relevant, and it's about how to get honey from a rock. There's lots of rocky places right now in the world. A lot of rocky things have been happening. But you know what? According to the Word of God, we can get honey from that rock. And so that's what it's about today. Join me as we have more on Lessons from the Sanctuary. To, to us, getting honey from a rock is similar to saying getting blood from a turnip. But actually, we're thinking backwards, as we often are. We don't have our heads on straight, or at least we don't have our God heads on straight, because there is a way of getting a honey from a rock. And we could also call it, uh, he gives us the desires of our heart, so therefore we have contentment between a rock and a hard place. To find satisfaction between a rock and a hard place. And to me, that is a very relevant message for God to speak to us. It's because in a real world, in real circumstances, there's a lot of rocks and a lot of hard places that we find ourselves in. There's a lot of tough times that we need to walk through. But the good news is, how do you get honey from the rock? I'm going to give you a little bit of a different twist on that scripture that says, for those who delight themselves in the Lord, he gives us the desires of our heart. And you may have heard this before, but I'll bet you several of you haven't. I want you to think of it from a different angle on delight yourself in the Lord, and he gives you the desires of your heart. What are your heart's desires? A lot of times we think in terms of well, I've tried to do my best, man. I come to church all of the time and everything, but I, you know, I've got desires in my heart, and man, they don't seem to be any closer than they were yesterday. And yet he promises to give us the desires of our heart. And so I got desires. When, when are my desires going to be fulfilled, God? And I want to ask you, what is your heart asking for? If you are someone who desires to delight yourself in the Lord and in his ways, then your heart is crying out, God, I want to serve you in any way that you have for me to serve you. I will go anywhere for you. Use me, oh God, use me in the place I'm at. Lord, the desire, that is what a heart that is delighting in God is crying to him. Lord, I dedicate myself to you. You are the Lord of my life. You are Lord, I'm not Lord, you're Lord. So Lord, your will, your way, that's what my heart cries as I delight myself in you. And then, God, why aren't you answering my prayer? And he says, you volunteered. I heard the cry of your heart to be your child and your servant. <coughs> My ways are pleasant. There is honey in the rocks. Contentment and peace and joy is found on the other side of total surrender and commitment and trust. It always is found on the other side of total surrender. And total surrender is a product of total trust. 
and saying, I'm not going to be the boss of me anymore. You're going to be the boss of me because you know where to take me. You know how to treat me. I am your child. You will never abuse me. But that doesn't mean that your way won't go through hard places. And I'm going to tell you right now the conclusion of the teaching. And actually, we probably could end it there, but except I'm going to detail it. God is interested in the satisfactions of your heart. But the very first command to man in the book of Genesis was, Be fruitful and multiply. Therefore, it's about others, not about you. And where He guides us and where He takes us is so that we can be Jesus for others. We can be a restorer for others. We can be, bring redemption to others. We can become fruitful in our lives. It's not about being fruitful for our wishes and wants except that those things come as a byproduct of serving God. But if the focus is on this is what I want and this is what I don't want and I'll serve you as long as you do it the way I want it done. You know, Paul was told three times no when he said, deliver me from these people because that's what the thorn was. It wasn't a physical abnormality, the thorn was the people that were buffeting him, constantly buffeting him. And God told him no. Why did he tell him no? For the same reason that my wife insisted that she would give my oldest daughter potato chips when my daughter wanted to get them for herself, but her hand was only big enough to pick up one. And if my wife allowed my daughter to have her way, she would have only gotten one. But since my wife said, I will get them for you, Julie, she got way more than one. When God limits and restricts us and says no to us, it's because there is a better way. But his primary purpose is the same command as we find in Genesis, be fruitful. Be fruitful. It's about bearing fruit. It's about bearing the fruit of righteousness. It's not about getting our wants and wishes taken care of first and then we'll do the fruit bearing. Because we find the fruit bearing is the first step of getting satisfaction in our lives. Mm -hmm. It's about others. Now, let me share with you one of the stories out of the Old Testament. It starts, it's it's a long story. I mean, it starts in Genesis 37, and it takes a couple of byways along the way. But primarily speaking, the story begins all uh, in Genesis 37 and continues all the way through Genesis 50. That is a significant enough story that I think he's probably trying to tell us something. He's trying to show us something. And he's showing us about the man of righteousness, the righteous man in this earth, and how God will use a righteous man in the story of Joseph. He is a symbol of the Messiah to come. But the reason that it's also important to us is not simply to point to the Messiah, but to show us what it's like to be a man of righteousness that's in the plan of God and purpose of God. And how he works in the lives of righteous men and women women, and navigates them through bad circumstances with redemption for them on the other end. You see, Joseph would not participate in the evils of his brothers. Yet it appears that his thank you was to be cast into a dungeon. God could have stopped that. Why didn't he? A lot of thanks I'm getting, God. Thank you very much. I made the right choice. I wouldn't participate with my brothers in their wickedness. And I'm thanked by you, because we blame God for everything. I'm thanked by you 
by getting thrown into a dungeon? But see, if you see the whole story, you see there was a purpose behind it, and that was the chapter, one of the chapters that had to happen to fulfill the long-term purpose of saving an entire nation. Do you want to, metaphorically, you want to save a nation or you just want to save yourself? Is it just all about you? Is it just all about me? I have prayed the prayer before that says that he will make us rich. And I've said, and there's one of the Psalms that says that he made them rich with the souls of men. And Joseph was the key man in saving an entire nation. And so the first thing that happened is, uh, well, Joseph gets thrown into a dungeon. All right. Then, as he gets rescued from the dungeon by the, a man named Potiphar, he was a captain of the king's army. Then what happened was he found favor in Potiphar's eyes. As he found favor in Potiphar's eyes, he grew up the ranks of authority. And as that, that authority increased in Potiphar and in his circumstances, you would think, okay, he is going to be in a position that this is what he's set up to do to save the nation. He's put in a position of authority over the nation. Then comes along Potiphar's wife. And she was a bad woman. She was a temptress. She was a seductress. And so what she ended up doing was as Joseph was taking care of things, she would say, hey, come on, let's, you know, the old man won't see it, you know. Let's, you know, I won't tell anybody. Lie with me. Lie with me. And this happened actually over a process of time, many times. And finally, she was in the house one day and Joseph repeatedly had said no. And finally she grabbed a hold of his shirt, his coat, and said, come lie with me. And so he took off running. So, what happens? She starts screaming. She's angry. And she accuses him of coming in and attacking her. What was Joseph thanks for being a man of righteousness? I'm finally in a position, Lord, where I can do something for you and save this nation. Oh, glory to God, you've given me the authority. And I have fended off this woman. I have fended off this seductress. I've been the man of righteousness. Thanks, God, for being a man of righteousness and rewarding me. I'm still in the dungeon. A lot of thanks he was getting, right? Well, he did find favor in the dungeon. And you know, lo and behold, a couple of years later, yeah, a couple of years, that's quite a while, a couple of years later, what happened? There were a couple of gentlemen that were going to get out. They were granted a pardon, and they were going to get out. And so they said, we will remember you to the king. We'll tell him the truth of what went on. And so he said, finally, God has provided the way. And as soon as they got out, they forgot. Thanks, God. Now he waited for several more years in the dungeon. And then the circumstances got to the point where he was in a position and I don't believe that the devil just kept thwarting everything. I believe that God continued to keep engineering things. Purposely engineering. And it's found in a word called meant. They meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And what happened was, is that Joseph found great favor and became 
second only to the king for the purpose of gathering the, his wisdom for gathering food in the famine and because there was a great famine coming and he had a dream and, and so forth. To make a long story short, Joseph ended up being the provision that got favor for his family and saved a nation. A little while later in Genesis 50, all of a sudden the brothers got afraid. They said, you know what? Joseph maybe is going to end up taking this out on us. Okay, he helped us out, but he's probably going to take this out on us. Once he starts thinking about it, he's going to take this out on us. And that's when Joseph said, please, don't worry about that. You're worrying over something that's not going to happen. Did you know that most worries that we have never happen? The greatest fear is fear itself. 99% of the things you fear never ultimately happen. Except for the torment that they give you. He says, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. The word meant is a very interesting word. Because it has to do with being planned, thought out, cunning, uh, crafty calculations. It's a word of strategy. In other words, the devil strategized evil. But in the process, God strategized this same circumstance for good. It's not, see, the devil can strategize He's willy, wily, coyote all over the place trying to be a strategist. And the truth of the matter is, is that's all right, let him strategize. That's what happened to Joseph. That's the story for us. The devil may have strategized this for my downfall, for bad for me, but God was in the middle of it, still out strategizing the devil. He will always out strategize the devil. Always, because he's God. Romans 8.28 says, He is able to work all things together for good. All things, everything, every circumstance. Yes. Jeremiah 29.11, this is another cool verse. He says that, uh, it uses the word that we have in, in Genesis, meant. And it says, I know the thoughts I think toward you, says the Lord. Peace and not evil, good and an expected and I know the thoughts I think is the same word used meant it I know the strategies I have for you says the Lord I know how I am strategizing for your benefit I know how I'm strategizing for the benefit of those whose lives you touch and it's for peace and not evil good and an expected end. The word expected end is also the word translated hope, and it comes from the Hebrew word tikva, which is a cord. And it's the cord that Rahab let down. It was the redemption cord. I know the redemption cord I have for you. It is hope of redemption. Not only for you, but that was once again, it was a redemption. They were let down because they saved a nation. It wasn't just about their welfare, that they didn't get caught by the army. So, shalom. I know the peace. It's peace and not evil. What is peace? Now, we think of peace, is, it's like wishing things will get better. Uh, it, it, it's helps us to manage contemporary difficulties by projecting a better tomorrow, a hopeful tomorrow. Well, I hope things will get better. It's ultimately without real foundation, though, actually. It's just hope. It's wishful thinking. That is not the Bible word, and I preached on this before, taught on it. That is not the Bible word for hope. The Bible word for hope is absolute for, for fulfillment in the purposes of God. It is absolute dependence based on God's power of redemption and God's plan. I know, let me give you the LS Amplified version of Jeremiah 29 11. 
the LS Amplified, and I encourage you to write your own Amplified versions. I'm teaching people how to do, by the way, we have class again this starts this Tuesday. I'm teaching people how to write their own Amplified versions, not to add to the scripture or take away, but make it fuller and it, it, as it comes in revelation and impacts their own heart. This is the Ellis Amplified version of Jeremiah 20, 29, 11. I know the plans and purposes that I am strategically calculating for you, says the Lord, and that is to grow in being well-rounded, complete, and full as God is full, instead of being out of balance, incomplete, and full of emptiness that is never satisfied. Because that's the, what evil means. Out of balance, and unfulfilled, never satisfied. Peace is something that is well-rounded and complete. Peace is actually a characteristic of God himself, the wholeness of God himself. That's why the Prince of Peace brings that aspect of the wholeness, the salvation, the completeness, the prosperity of God. That, that's hope when we have it from a spiritual standpoint. It is my purpose and desire to continually grant, because it's in the continuous tense, that word, that having, it, it's peace and not evil. He says the Lord, it's my desire to give you this. Well, it's a continue to, continue to keep giving. It doesn't stop, it's not a one-time giving. Has anybody ever thought that, well, God just did good for me yesterday. He's probably out of good for me for today. <laughs> you know, I mean, I probably used it up yesterday. You don't ever use up the goodness of God. He's always, he's always got it for you. So, I know the plans and purposes that I am strategically calculating for you, says the Lord, and that is to grow in being well-rounded, complete, and full, as God is full, instead of being out of balance, incomplete, and full of emptiness that is never satisfied. It is my purpose and my desire to continually grant to all your future days that they be filled with the confident expectation of God's strength to deliver you. That's the Ellis translation because that's just taking the words and putting, putting more explanation. See, we got, we got to retrain our brains. You know, we don't have, we, we, we often, the only reason we can't get honey out of a rock, because we got our brains on, we got our head on backwards. We're not thinking right. Do you know how they found the honey in the rock? Because they had to find it in the rocks. When they were going to gather honey, they went out into the hillside where all the rocks were and the cracks and the crevices. Anybody want to know how they found the honey? They listened for the bees. They listened for the bees. There were not, there were not honeycombs in every crevice. There were thousands and thousands of crevices. If they were just going to look for a crevice, they might get lucky now and then. But if they would listen to where the bees were buzzing, they would find the honey. And that translates to us that when we're in a rock, God has honey in that rock. God has honey in that rock, in the crevices between the rock and the hard place. There's lots of sweet honey in there. But listening to the Word of God, listening to the Spirit of God within you, that will show you where the honey is. So if you're in a place, I guarantee if you're in a hard place today, Tanya, if you're in a hard place today, Denise, if you're in a hard place today, if you're in a hard place today, if we're in a hard place today, then what that means is you know that God's got honey in the hard place. Don't run away from the hard place, especially if God keeps saying, no, you cannot leave here. Then that tells you that, oh, maybe I ought to, I ought to quit trying to escape the hard place and listen for the honey yes. and the Spirit of God will show you where the honey is that you not only can feed yourself 
but you can feed those who God has given you charge of, other people that are important. See, the thing that we need to realize and keep remembering is, it's not just about you getting what you want to happen when you want it to happen. You volunteered from this job. It's a good job to be a ambassador of the king sons and daughters on assignment what better job can you have than being a son or daughter of God on assignment that's what it means that's what it means to be his workmanship in Christ. grace is without works but it issues you into an assignment of works not to stay saved but to get others saved you don't need works to get yourself saved, but you have to do works so that others can be saved. How many people in the circumstance you've been trying to run from need your presence? Because you are redemption for them. Because if you will listen, God will put a word in you that becomes an apt word for them that changes their whole life. Here's the way that I am going to conclude today. This is something that will help usher you into a different frame of mind. First of all, you know from what we've talked about today that there is honey in the rock. And that's actually where the honey is. It's not sitting on a Hawaiian beach someplace. Did anybody get that? It's in the rocks. But this is how you, for you to access it. This is your prayer. It's a twofold prayer. And this is a good way to start your day and then repeat a few times throughout the day. Lord, I'm a son or a daughter on assignment today. What is important to you today? I want to be part of it. What is important to you today? See, many have been living their lives on, it's important for me to make a living today, or it's important for me to this or this or that or something else that has to do with self-sustenance. But as we begin to shift to our true assignment of being fruitful and multiplying, we want to know our purpose. If God showed you the whole book, he might give you a general outline. But if he showed you the whole book all at once, so I got it, God. I don't need you anymore. I can do this because you've shown me what to do. Most of the time, people are spending a lot of time trying to figure out their purpose. And God will not give it to them more than one page of one chapter at a time. Fulfill that page. That's my purpose today. What is important to you today? I want to be part of that. You've designed me to be part of that. I'm at this place at this time like Queen Esther. For such a time as this, I'm right here right now. What is important to you today? What is important to you today? I want to be part of that. What is important to you in this circumstance that, that has arisen today? I want to respond how you would respond in that. And guess what? You've got the Holy Spirit with you. And if you pray a prayer like that, God will guide you through your days. And sometimes, some days, he'll give you more of the plan than a page. But the more, the more your primary purpose is to develop your relationship with him, Amen. not to survive in life. Amen. It's your relationship with him, because as we serve him, there is always abundance on the other side.